and I start to feel this wave of dread and my legs feel like sandbags and my heart is heavy. This is why I didn't want to come here. I look up and I see on the other side of the road a man laying down in the street surrounded by a group of people. And in a voice devoid of any emotion, in a plain tone, I ask the question, what can I do to help? Tonight's theme is First Responders. There are as many kinds of responders as there are dilemmas to respond to. We all have the firefighters and the EMTs who train. That's their job. They rush into danger. But just as often, it's normal people who are just passing through living life when something was forced upon them. They had to react. My name is Jude Trader Wolf. I grew up in Wisconsin. I live on Long Island. I'm a creative arts therapist and a social worker. And I worked in private practice for a long, long time. And now I train therapists and teachers using improv and storytelling in their work. Wow, OK. So I'm, I'm very interested. What exactly uh, does the work of a creative arts therapist entail? Creative arts therapy is just using the arts in any way you can to help people to express what's going on with them, to express how they've changed, how they're struggling. And what do you feel it is about the arts that allows people to heal when they work through them? When you tap into that part of yourself, that I, I can go into something that I don't know how it's going to turn out, I'm not going to judge it until it becomes whatever it's going to become, gives people a lot of strength and, and courage to change themselves, just to tap into the part of you that knows I can look at things a different way than I ever did before. I can look at myself in a, in a way that I never did before. And then I can make something and then talk about it and claim it and show it and express it. I'm lying on my back, looking into the piercing blue eyes of Sharon, my new acupuncturist, who's taking my pulse, and she says, I see you're having headaches and a lot of back pain. Tell me about what's happening emotionally. And she starts putting needles in, and I say, oh, I feel worried all the time. I have this heaviness in my chest that I thought was heart disease, but it turned out to be just plain old sadness. And I have this feeling like all is lost. It's depression, I guess. And then she puts a needle in my left arm that sends a jolt of pain through my entire body. And I feel like jumping off the table. And she goes, ah, that is the wounded healer point. What do you do for work? And I say, I'm a therapist. I know, a therapist who feels like all is lost. <laughs> it's like a ski instructor that's afraid of heights. <laughs> and she says, well, you've got a pretty good case of burnout, it looks like. And that tracks. It's 2011, and I've spent the last 10 years doing a great deal of treatment with people who were directly impacted by the attacks on the World Trade Center. Spouses of first responders, people who were the last to speak to a loved one that died in the towers that day, survivors who saw terrible things and are haunted by these images. And now what they saw and they heard and remember is stuck in my brain and is waking me up at night and giving me panic and depression. And I say to Sharon, the worst thing about it is that I feel ashamed and embarrassed that I have all these symptoms now because it didn't happen to me. I didn't lose anybody. And she says, well, you lost something. And, and that's what you have to work out. And I'm trying. I'm in a support group for trauma therapists run by a, a, a burnout specialist in New York City. And uh, she, her prescription is know yourself, love yourself, and ground yourself in something that gives you a sense of wonder to go into these dark places with people. So for me, that's a memory I've had my whole life. I'm 11 years old, lying on the hood of our parents' Chevrolet station wagon with my sister and brother, staring at an astonishing display of shooting stars all night long. And my brother, who's an aspiring physicist, says that some of the stars we're looking at don't even exist anymore. They burned out maybe centuries ago in some faraway galaxy. But light travels forever. And so we see those stars as if they exist right now. And they'll continue to travel into the future. So some other kids on some other planet looking, looking on their parents' vehicle will see that, that same light as if those stars still exist. And this fills me with wonder that has always sustained me. And I cannot connect with it 
anymore. And this year, like every year, I get invited to events on the anniversary created by an organization called Voices of September 11th that was created by two social workers who did lose someone in the, in the towers, their sons, and they have an organization that offers trauma recovery and resilience training, and they invite first responders to come to these events on the anniversary, and I can't go. I don't know why. So I do acupuncture, and I do yoga. Um, I go to a Zen Buddhist retreat where they teach you how to lose yourself. I take improv classes where you have to get over yourself. <laughs> so I have to know myself, love myself, lose myself, and get over myself. <laughs> it's like I'm dating myself, but with a copay. <laughs> In 2015, maybe the improv had an impact. I finally say yes to this invitation to go on the anniversary to the events that they have. And I get off the subway and walk toward the newly built World Trade Center, and I start to feel this wave of dread. And my legs feel like sandbags, and my heart is heavy, and, and I'm, I have palpitations, and my throat is dry, and I go, here are these symptoms again. This is why I didn't want to come here. But I go, and I open the door to this event space, and it's a beautifully appointed banquet room, dimly lit, candles on each circular table with linen tablecloths, and on each table is a little plaque that identifies who will be sitting there to find your place. So over here is a sign that says Sandy Hook Trauma Team, and over here it says Boston Marathon Trauma Team, over here San Bernardino Trauma Team, and I find my table, which is a bunch of therapists like myself that are here alone, and the the hum of people talking in that room, people who do this work, I feel an easing in my chest. I feel like I belong with these people. And the talks are wonderful, one after another. And the last one is an FBI agent who was the person responsible for the final disposition of the plane that flew into the Pentagon. And as she was going through these parts the last time, she saw something sticking out of the seat back. And she reaches in there and pulls out a pocketbook. And in this pocketbook is a wallet and letters that are folded up into tiny squares. And she realizes that these are letters that were written by a woman who knew what was happening, and she wanted to find any way she could to communicate with her family what was happening to her and what she was feeling for them. And she did everything she could to make that happen, and they put these letters together, and the FBI agent said she delivered them herself to the husband. And she said, I'm so sorry it took us all this time to get these to you. And he said, it's OK. My son is having a really rough go. And this is like she's still with us. It's just the right time for us. And to me, these letters are what hope looks like. Because she knew that all was lost, and she did it anyway. And I feel wonder and awe. And I think I'll never again say that all is lost, because you never know. And you have to do what you can, and do everything you can. And I think about the shooting stars, and that the light goes on forever. Thank you. My name is Dan Leonard, and I'm from Arlington, Massachusetts. I work in biotech. I work at a small biotech company, and we're developing gene therapies for hemophilia and Huntington's disease. So our theme focuses tonight on first responders, and I understand that you were one, and I'm just wondering what motivated you to you know, take up that line of work? Well, um, I had spent a lot of time in the outdoors, so I did a lot of skiing and backcountry skiing and hiking and backpacking. and. When you're out in the backcountry, it's really important to be able to take care of uh, an emergency situation if it happens. Um, and there's definitely a pride that comes with that. It's sort of a badge of honor if, you know, you're out in the backcountry and people know that you have that first response experience. Uh, you know, people definitely um, appreciate having that skill set uh, around. So that was part of the motivation for me doing that. And is storytelling something that you've always been interested in? You know, it is. Um, I have an English literature um, degree, and I love writing and, and poetry. Um, and so storytelling has always been something that has been, um, that I've been passionate about. Um, but I've never 
actually done anything spoken word on stage before. So this is a, this is a new experience for me. It's a dark winter evening, and I'm driving through a maze of back streets uh, that wind their way through a small city just north of Boston. I'm on my way to pick up my date. It's our first date, and I'm nervous, and I'm excited, and importantly, I'm on time. I will admit that I had some experiences in my past of being late to pick up dates, and sometimes it was no big deal, and sometimes it didn't go so well. And I'm determined to be on time, so I left very early. As I round a bend, my headlights illuminate an old work boot in the middle of the road. Now, before I'd ever done any first response work, uh, the sight of a shoe in the road wouldn't have signified anything to me, but uh, at this point, um, I've gotten my Wilderness First Responder certification, which I did in order to become a ski patroller at Killington up in Vermont, uh, which I did for two seasons. And while at Killington, I had a lot of time to speak with other patrollers who were EMTs or police, and I had come to learn a rather dismaying fact, which is a car can hit somebody so hard that it can knock them right out of their shoes. So at this point, the sight of a shoe anywhere near a roadway fills me with dread, but I'm hoping in this instance that that's not what's happening. But I look up and I see on the other side of the road uh, a man laying down in the street um, with one shoe, surrounded by a group of people. At this point, I could just look the other way and drive on and be on time for my date, but nobody's helping him, and I just can't in good conscience just pass by. So I pull my car over to the side of the road, I jump out, I pop the trunk, I grab my first aid belt, and I run across the street. So there's this interesting phenomenon that I think other people who have done first response can probably relate to, um, before you have any training or experience, um, you may not have seen a lot of things like this happen in your day-to-day -day life, but after you have experience, it's like, it's like you're, you tune into this radio frequency that was always there, but you just never were aware, and you start to see stuff everywhere. So I have a sense of what I need to do in this situation, so um, I walk you know, across the street and I approach him, and I see that his eyes are open, but he's semi-conscious. His mouth is open, but he's not speaking. He's breathing, thank goodness, uh, but he's bleeding profusely from his head. So I want to address the bleeding, but even more importantly, I want to stabilize his head. So in this type of a, like a high-impact accident, there's a risk that uh, the person could have a fractured cervical spine. And if they have a fractured cervical spine and their head moves at all, the fractured vertebrae could actually hit the spinal cord and cause paralysis uh, or even kill them. So I kneel down and I position myself at his head. I reach into my first aid pack and um, I want to pull out some latex gloves. The cardinal rule of first response is that you need to make sure that you, as the first responder, are safe before you can help anybody else. I have no gloves. I must have used them at a previous scene and just forgot to replenish them. So the only thing that I can think to do is to wrap my hands in cravats. So cravats are like these two by two pieces of linen cloth that we used to use on the mountain to make slings for people. So I wrap my hands in all that I have and I put my hands on either side of his head. And as I do that, I just feel the blood soaking right through them. But at this point, I'm, I'm all in. So I start to talk to him and say things like, just you know, keep calm, I don't want you to move, you know, help is on the way. And as I do that, I smell alcohol coming off of his breath. And I realize that he's also drunk. A short time passes and um, he starts to kind of come to you and uh, he starts to mumble incoherently and he wants to sit up. And you know, I'm telling him just, I don't want you to move, I just want you to lay there. Uh, just, you know, stay calm, but he's not listening to me, and he starts to sit up. And at that point, I say to myself that I'm actually going to do more harm than good if I forcibly try to hold his head in place. 
Um, so I let go. And the bloody cravats fall to the pavement, and he sits up. At that point, the police arrive, and I look at them, and I say, am I okay to go? And they say yes, and I start to head back to my car. This is a moment in first response that it took me a long time to get used to. Um, you know, you, in a lot of situations, um, you become uh, an intimate participant in what is very likely one of the most consequential moments of this person's life. But you finish your work and you just walk away. You'll never know who they are. You'll never know their name. You'll never know even how they turned out. In some situations, you might never know if they ended up living or dying. I go back to my car. I look at the clock. At this point, I am officially very late. Um, I gun it to try to make up some time. I get to her house. Um, I run up the stairs, and I knock on the door, and she comes to the door, and she looks absolutely beautiful. And um, she starts to step out, and I say, uh, hold on a second, it, it, can I use your bathroom? I mean, that's pretty embarrassing. Like, you show up on a date and you want to use the bathroom, and I'm like, no, I mean, I, there's a reason for this. And she starts to take a look at me, and she notices that um, my clothes are dirty and kind of disheveled, and I hold out my hands, and she sees the blood. Now, at this point, she would have been perfectly justified slamming the door in my face and just moving on with her life. Uh, but she doesn't. She invites me to come in, and I go in, and I use the bathroom, and I get washed up, and we head out on our date, and on the ride to the restaurant, I explain to her everything that, that happened, and she just totally rolls with it. We have a wonderful evening, um, and neither of us could have ever imagined that night that a few short years later we'd be married and responding to these types of incidents together. Uh, there was the time that we were at the airport, and we saw a guy laying on the sidewalk in a pool of blood. He had tripped over the curb and fallen and smashed his nose into the ground. Um, I knelt down to see what I could do to help, and she went into our luggage and got our travel first aid kit. She reached in, and she pulled out a pair of latex gloves. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> My name is Praveen Sahai. I was born and brought up in a city called Patna, which is in the eastern part of India. And I studied uh, nuclear physics, finished my master's, and then I did a variety of different jobs and eventually worked with the United Nations as a peacekeeper in Africa. And now um, my job is to look, find companies um, and entrepreneurs who are coming up with very innovative solutions to prevent and mitigate climate change. When you started out working, I mean, did you envision that? Did you think, okay, nuclear physics, UN peacekeeper, working on climate change, and now a storyteller, did you see all that laid out in front of you, or did everything sort of just happen as it happened? Uh, everything happens uh, unexpectedly. I think of, you know, life like a, we are floating in the stream of life. And the only thing that I have done, which is different from many people, is I'm never afraid to let go. So if I see a new, new opportunity come by, it is like I am leave in a stream of life and I'm on the shore uh, stuck somewhere and then a tug comes in and something pulls me into, back into the stream again, I've never been afraid to let go. I'm 14 when I learned to shoot a rifle. Guns in India are very rare because people are not allowed to buy them. But I'm part of this National Cadet Corps, which is sort of a junior version of the ROTC. And they have these old heavy rifles from the Second World War, which are nearly as tall as I am at the time. Nevertheless, I learned to shoot the rifle and I become a fairly good marksman, which then allows me to participate in state competitions and represent my uh, local shooting club. Rifle shooting for me is nothing but a sport at the time in which I'm good at. I'm also able to convince my parents to buy me an air gun. So it is not an accident that 10 years later, when I finished my master's in nuclear physics, that I decided to become a pistol-carrying assistant commandant in the armed police of India. I lead hundreds of armed troops into areas affected by violence, and we are mostly using our batons rather than guns to deal with the crowds, but nevertheless, the guns have become an important tool of the trade. And I also take pride in the fact that they give me a sense of power 
as well as a sense of invincibility. Life takes a more interesting turn when I'm deployed to work with the United Nations Peace Mission in Mozambique, in Africa. There are 30 nations or so that have uh, contributed and committed their troops, and I'm one of the 75 police officers from India to go to Mozambique. The country has been wrecked by 15 years of militia violence. The war has killed a million people and caused millions more to flee to the neighboring countries of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania. Outside of the capital city of Maputo, every building has been bombed. In the early 90s, this land is known as the most heavily mined country in the world. I'm talking about land mines, not diamond mines. It is a surprise, therefore, when I reach there that I'm told that as a peacekeeper, I'm not allowed to carry any weapons. Given how dangerous the place is, that seems like lunacy. My role as a national elections coordinator means that I'm not only supporting policy and administration from the headquarters, but I'm also building technology tools and providing training in the field, so I'm traveling a lot. I'm even more worried because my adventurous wife has now joined me with our one-year-old son, and our apartment has already been burgled twice. So I seriously consider quitting, but the stakes are too high. I truly believe in this mission, which is going to liberate 15 million people from repeated cycles of violence and poverty. So I start to learn new behaviors uh, so that I can teach myself on how to approach strangers with humility and establish a direct connection and ask simple questions such as, Ola, MK Paso Ajudar, hello, how can I help you today? A month later, I'm 1,000 kilometers north near a town called Beira. After finishing work, I and my colleague are walking down a dirt street to buy some local food. It's already getting dark. And as we turn around a corner, we are suddenly face to face with about 10 people in military gear. They quickly surround us. My hands instinctively go to my hip, but of course there is no gun. My brain leaps into this alien zone where I feel no emotion, no fear, no anger. All the senses lock into the present. I become hyper aware of every movement. I can hear every sound and every thought. And in a voice devoid of any emotion, in a plain uh, tone, I ask the question, what can I do to help? And I repeat that question again and again because they're not responding, they're simply glaring down at us. I think about my own mugging two months ago by half a dozen people armed with guns and knives in broad daylight. I'm also thinking about all of the reports of lootings and abductions of my colleagues. But I do know that all of the abducted colleagues have come back safely after we have shipped additional foods and supplies. Maybe this is all they want, some food. I observe their faces more closely. Despite their grubby and mercenary appearance, their eyes do not convey any violence or anger. In the meantime, this human ring has started to move. And we are getting shoved along, and I feel the pressure of hands and bodies against me, and I'm frustrated that I have absolutely no ability to defend myself. And now they're arguing about something. They're shouting at each other. The voices are rising and I'm afraid that any moments guns are going to come out. And then suddenly, without warning, they stop. They push us back, they turn around, and they disappear in the darkness. My brain takes a moment to unfreeze and come back to reality, and for the first time, I'm aware of the deep terror, the shaking in my legs and the deep thumping in my chest. There is also the sense of relief at being alive and free. I look at my colleague, and without a word, we start walking back. The next day, we are back. I'm back at my house, and I, boy, I have never been happier to see my wife and my son. But I do not speak a word about the encounter. What's the point of scaring her even more? Our work continues for another six months. The lootings and the abductions uh, come down because the locals begin to realize that they don't need any violent posturings from us. If they need any help, they can simply come up and ask. 
In the month of October of 94, Mozambique holds its first ever elections. An unprecedented 93% of the citizens turn out to vote. The voting actually carries on for three days. The United Nations declares it a big success. For us, it has been a gratifying experience and even a majestic one at times. But it all started by removing guns from the hands of the people and removing guns from my hands. After that day, I have never picked up a gun, never have felt the need to do so. Instead, I use my experience with words and compassion to connect with people to do everything I do. Thank you. Watch Stories from the Stage anytime, anywhere. Visit worldchannel.org for full episodes and digital extras. Join us on social media and share your story only on World Channel.